We have a big topic today, the appeal of uh, violent extremism and migration, and we have a very renowned panel. Uh, so what I'd like to do this morning is we have about an hour and a half. We will start with 45 to 50 minutes of discussion among the panel. Then we'll turn it over to the audience, starting first with our Mo Ibrahim uh, fellows and scholars and allow them to ask a few questions so that we can get the voice of the young leaders of this continent into this discussion. And then I'll turn it over to you. Um, let me uh, first introduce our panel. I'll sit down and um, introduce the panelists. I first, uh, our host, uh, Youssef Amrani, who was a member of the Royal Cabinet of His Majesty King Mohammed the, the Sixth. Then we have, of course, Emir Muhammadu Sanusi II, the Emir of Kano, a nobleman and a respected Islamic scholar with law degrees in Sharia and Islamic studies. Um, then we have Jean-Marie Gehano, who's the president and CEO of the International Crisis Group, also has served as the longest serving UN Undersecretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, overseeing the greatest expansion of peacekeeping operations. And finally, we have another diplomat, Martin Kobler, who's a career diplomat and a veteran of the German Foreign Service, including ambassador to Iraq and Egypt. He's long served in the United Nations as well, as special rep of the UN support mission in Libya. Thank you very much, Ayat. Hello, my name is Aya. Uh, I'm from Tunisia, and I was uh, a Mo Ibrahim scholar last year uh, at SOAS. Um, and I did my uh, thesis on youth radicalization, recruitment of Daesh in Tunisia, and recruitment of Al Shabaab Mujahideen in Kenya. Um, so, my cousin in 2013, when he was 22 years old, he was radicalized. He's a, a graduate, an engineer. Uh, he's middle class, he's not unemployed. And he decided to go to fight in Syria. We succeeded to de-radicalize him, uh, but that made me feel that radicalization is knocking my family's door, and that's how I got involved in, in working in this. I have three main points, if you allow me to get across them. The first one is there are many um, states now or countries that try to project in the public imagination a rhetoric of fear and surveillance uh, to justify the treatment of young people as suspects of terrorism. Um, don't you think that uh, de-radicalization policies are further radicalizing the youth? Don't you think that the UN global uh, counterterrorism strategy is giving a free hand to states to violate youth rights, to justify online censorship, to stigmatize youth based on their age? Uh, and to me, uh, the state response to terrorism so far has been typically retributive because it's resulting in, in a collective punishment of young people. Now, the uh, report on uh, Africa Tipping Point shows that um, the more the state violence against civilians, the more uh, we see terrorism in the country. Yet, UN programs and state programs focus on building a culture of peace for the youth, uh, nonviolent communication for young people, building peace builders. But to me, the people who need first nonviolent communication are security forces because they are breeding <laughs> the violence. The second point um, is really about youth agency. So, don't you think this argument of young people are helpless? Uh, and jobless and desperate, and that's why they join these terrorist groups is becoming invalid with facts and data. Um, I don't think that unemployment can make someone go to violent extremism, but rather the perception of injustice. So the question is, is deeper than unemployment, is really about inequality. The, the second response to that is also the legitimization of power that you touch on on the state. Young people see these extremist groups as legitimate fighters and not as perpetrators of violence. So these groups offer something bigger than the nation state and the national identity. Uh, Daesh has no visa restriction. The average Asian Daesh is 30 years old. They have 80 citizenship and they speak more than 30 languages. So people still ask why young Tunisians who started the 21st century revolutions are the highest number of foreign fighters in Daesh. Well, because young <coughs> Tunisians would like to challenge the status quo and Daesh stands as a policy preference. The third point is to really ask you about um, where is the threat? What is the threat and where is the threat? We've been told for the past seven years in North Africa that Daesh is the ultimate threat 
and many funding has been put into countering violent extremism. If you look at youth violence around the world, it's really in homicides and crimes. And if you look where it's taking place, it's taking place in the United States and in South America, not in Africa. So making us believe that we are the most dangerous region in the world is really true. After the revolution in Tunisia, many countries came and put so much money into countering violent extremism. But no one is helping us to counter trafficking or human trafficking. Very few have put money in investing in youth uh, and employment, in investing in combating violence against women, in investing in desertification. If you want to know what's the biggest threat for Tunisia in the next 10 years, it's actually drought and floods. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Tough question, huh? Does anyone want to address any of that? <laughs> no, a, a tough act to follow. I take it as a statement. <laughs> no, that's exactly what I want well, to I, say. I can she give raised. one example, actually. Yes. So, who, what, which country in the world is the country with the highest rate of violent deaths per 100,000 after Syria, which is number one? The United States. Salvador. <laughs> Salvador. 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 Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's, it, it, makes, uh, it makes the point very, very, very strongly. Yes. This is where crime has become a way of life and the, the, the distinction between crime and politics has disappeared. Yeah. Okay. I want to say only two words to the, uh, our Tunisian colleagues. I think you raised very crucial questions and you also answered this question. You said you didn't understand how a young Tunisian, graduate from engineer, got, got radicalized. I would say the same thing in the, the guy in France or in Belgium who was educated in French schools with the La Loi de la République and radicalized. So it's a big question that he has a good job and he wants to fight. No, I think one issue we didn't tackle today about migration, so to come back, is the issue, and it was very well mentioned in the book, the issue of climate change. Mm -hmm. I think this issue, we didn't give it, a, 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 it is one of the important issues we have to tackle. That's why in Africa, and again, here in Marrakesh, three uh, 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 few months ago, we had a summit on the margins of the COP22 on African leaders, because we think today we need to address this issue of climate change. It is one of the major causes of migration and, and this is, I think, one issue. Maybe next time uh, more, we will have something on this climate change issue. Okay. So with that, I'd like to very much thank our distinguished panel. Um, I think that they've given us tremendous insight. And I also want to thank all of you for being an outstanding audience. Thank and you. And we'll move on to the next question. <laughs>